Hey, and welcome back to the Horsepower Monster. You know, there's an old saying in hot rodding, and I bet you've all heard it before, there is no replacement for displacement. And of course, as soon as somebody will say that, some smart aleck will pipe up and say, well, unless you've got boost. And I've never really understood that because I can put boost on a big block just as easily as I can a little four banger. So the question for today is, how does boost affect horsepower when we're changing the cubic inches? Going to do some dyno testing. And of course, if you know us, you know there's no reason to do anything unless you're just going to totally overdo it. So our dyno testing has got a 565 cubic inch big block compared to an identical 632. And both of them are going to have a giant 1471 blower on top. Stick around. This is going to be fun. You know, it's difficult to do displacement testing because you basically need two identical engines except for differences in bore and or stroke. So that's why you rarely ever see that with the magazines or the videos or anything like that. So we've been keeping our eye out for a couple of years now for an opportunity to do a little displacement testing like this. And when this opportunity arose with our friends over at Automotive Specialist, you better believe we jumped on it. Our friends, Keith and Jeff Dorton at Automotive Specialist, had a pretty unique situation come up when they got a job to rebuild a brand new and already complete engine. And I gotta say, it's a sweet one too. The engine came in because the original builder was having trouble getting it properly tuned on the dyno. Now, I don't wanna slam anybody, especially engine builders who work too hard for too little money. And of course, I don't even know what the root problem was that kept the engine from firing up in the first place. All I know is that it was a 565 cubic inch big block with a 1471 blower on top. And once Jeff got it fired up and running, it did great. But the engine was a 565 cubic inch big block with a giant 1471 blower from the blower shop perched on top. So anyway, EFI and cylinder head specialist Jeff Dorton was able to get the blown big block up and running with a Holly Dominator ECU managing the engine controls. And it wasn't a bad engine at all. With a little tuning, it was able to make peaks of 1,111.4 horsepower at 6,500 RPM and 940.4 foot-pounds of torque at 5,500. Now, that amount of horsepower in a street application honestly should be enough for anybody. But the owner, understandably, wasn't happy. Now, you gotta understand that he had asked for a 632 cubic inch big block and when Keith and Jeff Dorton told him that it was really only 565 cubic inches, he was a little bummed. Also, he had been told that it was gonna make at least 1200 horsepower. And when this ran on the dyno and was 90 low, obviously that disappointed him too. So the owner asked Keith and Jeff Dorton to just keep the engine and fix the issues. Together, the three decided to build a brand new 632 cubic inch big block and reuse the cylinder heads blower and everything else they could and then the old 565 cubic inch short block would be sold or reused in another project no doubt an expensive mistake for the engine's owner but it's great news for us rarely does any engine go across the dyno twice with only a single significant difference for us to test it's just too costly for most people in terms of time and money but this is the perfect opportunity to test how an additional almost 70 cubic inches will affect performance in a blown big block. I know, it felt like Christmas. Yes, both horsepower and torque should go up, but the question is, where in the RPM range is it gonna be most beneficial? And another thing to consider is generally, engines lose efficiency as they gain cubic inches. So that's why the horsepower per cubic inch ratio is usually favored in the little four cylinders versus a big V8. So, since we're running the biggest 632 we can get, are we going to be disappointed with the horsepower gains? Only one way to find out. Obviously, we weren't around for the first engine build, so I don't have much video of that to show you. But, we can get started with the 632. Even though they use two different physical blocks, a cast iron Merlin 4 block from World Products was chosen for both builds. The Merlin 4 architecture can handle big power and usually comes at an affordable price. So that makes it the perfect option for this build. The 10.2 deck height is critical in order to build a 632 with this ridiculous 4 and 3 quarter inches of stroke. 
Engine builder Keith Dorton has to do a little manual machining on the snout of the crank. Since we'll be running a big blower that will be spun off the crankshaft, we'll need two keyways to provide plenty of bite between the snout and the blower pulley. Dorton cut the second keyway into the forged Monar crankshaft on a manual milling machine. Now we don't have to worry about ripping the Woodruff key out with a single keyway setup. The pistons are flat tops from JE Pistons to help to keep the compression down despite the extra stroke. As you can see, the compression height for the rings has been minimized so that Keith can fit in the longest connecting rod possible. This requires using a machined insert in the wrist pin bores to support the oil ring. The inserts just slide in and the O-rings themselves keep them from coming out and rubbing the cylinder bores. The forged H-beam connecting rods are also from Monar Technologies and measure out at 6 inches 700 thousandths from center to center. Now this is a new cam for the 632 build because Keith wanted to go with a reduced base circle cam to prevent the chance of the big end of a connecting rod hitting a cam lobe. But the two cams that were used are very similar. This one is ground with 278 and 285 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths tappet lift. There's also 425 thousandths of an inch of lobe lift and a 110 degree intake center line. Dorton uses a highly efficient Jessel belt drive to control the cam timing. These setups have turned out to be quite durable. And as you can see, we've already got the ARP head studs in place to provide optimum clamping force when the cylinder heads are bolted up. For oil control, we'll be using a fully fabricated wet sump pan from Steph's. It's got the cutouts in the oil pan rails to fit the extra stroke and includes a windage screen and segments to maintain a constant supply of oil around the pickup. Windage can be a big issue with long stroke engines because the crankshaft reaches deeper into the oil pan. To help minimize this, the Steph's pan kicks out on the passenger side of the pan to make a bit more room for the oil to sling off the crankshaft and not bounce right back onto it. But, this moves the kick out over the pan rail on the block. In order to secure the pan to the block, you have to run the bolts through the kick out. These holes are either sleeved to seal out oil or threaded so the O-ring plugs can be installed after the nuts are tight. A dab of heavy grease in the socket is an old school engine builder's trick to make sure the nut doesn't fall out until it's threaded onto the stud. The cylinder heads are a set of 24 degree castings from Brodix. They are the exact same ones we ran in the smaller engine setup. Now these are their headhunters with the chamber size of 123 cc's. That'll make the final compression ratio for the 632 engine 9.64 to 1. Now those valves are sized at 2 inches 400 thousandths for the intakes and an inch 850 thousandths for the exhausts. The heads are also set up to accept extra studs, which have already been installed to provide additional clamping load to the block. Up top, we've got a set of PSI valve springs with Exodyne retainers that are installed at 2 inches 50 thousandths. That combo is good for 220 pounds of spring pressure at the seat and 750 over the nose. Here, you can see how the valve angles are canted toward the center of the cylinder. It's one of the big block's secret weapons when it comes to moving lots of air and making big power. The headhunter line of cylinder heads are fully CNC ported with a 24 degree valve angle to help flow. At our max gross valve lift of 703 thousandths of an inch, 
This head can flow an impressive 455 CFM through the intake ports. For improved valve train control, Keith is using a set of aluminum bodied shaft mount rocker arms from Jezel. These are the stock 1.7 to 1 rocker ratio. And now it's time to party. Oh, and by the way, while this is a bucks down big power build, it still has to survive on the street. So it gets a serpentine belt setup from CVF Racing that gives us an alternator, power steering pump, and even an AC compressor. Hey, you've got to be comfortable when you're blasting out thousand plus horsepower. Also, you can see the big rib blower pulley mounted to the assembly on the crankshaft. And that aluminum plate just behind the CVF serpentine setup will be the front motor mount that mounts to the custom front clip in the Chevelle this build is going into. The blower is a legitimate beast of a piece of machinery. This is a huge 1471 blower from the blower shop and it's definitely no lightweight. So Jeff and Keith Dorton use the shop crane to gently lower it in place just to make sure the gasket doesn't get wrinkled and nothing gets scratched. Notice we've taken the engine off of the engine stand and now have it on the dyno cart for greater stability because with all this on there, it's starting to get just a little bit heavy. One thing we ran into is the extreme size of the blower case means it extends over the distributor boss in the intake manifold. Not only do you have to run the spider style distributor cap to get it to fit, but the distributor must be dropped into place before the blower goes on. Anyhow, let's move on to the dyno and get what we're all really here for. Fuel is fed to the engine through the plate underneath the hat. It uses 160 pound per hour injectors and the location above the blower is important because the fuel actually has secondary benefits of providing lubrication and cooling to the spinning lobes inside the blower case. And this is the setup for the dyno test. The braided lines you see coming off the front of the fuel plate are the return lines for the fuel system. Now in the car, they'll likely have a more sanitary setup that's more tucked away, but for the dyno, we're just worried about everything working properly overlooks. So this is good enough. So let's get started. By the way, the ignition tables and fuel maps, and really everything else when it comes to engine controls, are handled by a Holley Dominator ECU. During the pull with the 632 cubic inch version of the engine, the boost pressure was steady at 12.3 PSI throughout the pull. The fact that it didn't increase with RPMs is a sign that the engine might be choked for air. Keith and Jeff suggested that the blower hat with its three holes that measure out at three and three quarter inches might not allow enough airflow to properly feed this big 632 and it's also spinning up a giant 1472 blower at over 6,000 RPM. But they didn't have another one to swap on. Still, it made peaks of 1,253 horsepower and 1,106 foot-pounds of torque. Very impressive considering there might be even more to be had with a bigger blower hat. Now, I wasn't there when the engine was dynoed at 565 cubic inch form, but Jeff Dorton provided me the dyno results and I'll overlay them here. Still, not bad output, but we're talking averages across the pull that are 157.3 horsepower and 109.4 foot-pounds of torque less. The peaks are 1,111.4 horsepower 
and 940.4 foot-pounds of torque. So that means the bigger 632 improved the peak numbers by 141.6 horsepower and 165.6 torque. So the improvements are definitely solid, but we wouldn't also call them outrageous. And they could potentially be even larger with a freer flowing hat, but we didn't have one at the time to try. As you can see, the shape of the horsepower and torque curves were basically the same shape across both pulls, just with more on the 632. And there wasn't any real drop-offs as the RPMs increased. An average gain of 157.3 horsepower by adding 67 cubic inches comes out to 2.35 horsepower per cubic inch, which sounds about right for approximately 12 pounds of boost. Plus, we never even changed the blower pulley and the injectors were at 80% duty cycle, so there may be even more that can be squeezed out of this 632 combo with bigger injectors at more capacity. But the owner was happy with the new power numbers for the 632, and this is for a street car and not a drag racer after all, and he cannot wait to drop it into the Chevelle he's building. So the lesson here is the gains are pretty linear. More cubic inches didn't favor either the lower pull or the upper RPM range, which is pretty cool. We just made power all the way through the pull, and that's exactly what we wanted. Hey, leave a comment and give us your opinion on whether the extra power of the 632 is worth it or if the 565 is more than enough. Thanks for watching the Horsepower Monster, and we'll see you next time with another great build.